let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, that you, God, have given us, Lord, a, a robe of white that we are going to wear in heaven someday with you, Lord. And Lord, if there's someone here tonight that doesn't know for sure that you are their Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that tonight be the night that they make those things right, that they settle that in their hearts tonight, oh God. God, we thank you that we have a, a place where we can come and hide away from this wicked world. Lord, as it's been a, a tough first half of the week, Lord, we need a, a place, Lord, where we can hear yeah, thus say the Lord and be comforted by your word. So God, I pray that we uh, come seeking you, Lord, that our hearts are open open, waiting on the word of God to just calm us, Lord, and comfort us. And God, that whatever is said, Lord, it blesses our heart and we can use it to grow, grow in you. So Lord, we're thankful. We're thankful for our church, Lord, that we can come and worship you here and serve you. And God, that you can speak to us. Lord, we pray for the speaker, Lord, that you be with him, Lord. You put your hand of blessing upon him. And God, that you use the message that he said to work on hearts, Lord. Thank you for all you do, and we pray for your continued blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, you may be seated. I'll stay here. Oh, I will. So the air conditioner is not broken. Um, we just didn't turn it on early enough. So, And it didn't feel too bad in here. But when you're up here waving your arms like this, it starts to get warm. But, uh, yeah. I'm going to go through the, uh, this is Sharon's night. So Sharon, if you're watching at home, uh, this is the night you should have been here because it's nice and toasty inside. And I know you, I know she'd like that. So this is her service. I'm going to go through the announcements as we get ready to take up the offering this evening. Saturday men's and women's prayer meeting here at the church at nine o'clock. Then our soul winning meeting. And then we go out and preach the gospel. Sunday morning, our Sunday school hour is at 9.30. 9.30 in the morning, sharp. And then the morning service is at 10.30. So let's make sure we're in our places, that we're here for the preaching and teaching of the word of God on Sunday. If you have a cell phone, please make sure that that is powered off at this time. Silence so that it's not a distraction to the word when it's brought forth shortly. And then uh, Brother Barker will be with us on July the 7th. Uh, Brother Taylor Cranfill to Chicago, missionary to Chicago, uh, north side, be starting a church, will be with us the following Sunday, and then we'll have a VBS work party that day, and then launch the jungle journey the next day on the 15th here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. It is a Monday through Friday, Vacation Bible School, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a success if everybody does their part, uh, including prayer. Um, prayer, prayer, prayer. And then prospecting, letting people know about it. Um, again, we, we have never had just our church kids and, and our bus kids. There's always been kids from the community, uh, co-workers, kids, relatives, kids, neighbors. Please talk about the Vacation Bible School because it can make the difference in someone's life, literally. And um, I believe in that. And so please talk it up, talk it up, get flyers, they're available and let's be ready for a wonderful week. Uh, we still don't have that single winner for the anniversary Sunday, so when you turn it in, we will get the award to the appropriate person. Um, Academy packets are due tonight. If you are coming to Cornerstone Baptist Academy this fall, we need those packets tonight. Um, there are some new families that of course, they're not here. They're at their church, uh, Garfield Ridge. They have their church service tonight. They had to adjust their schedule because of some other activities. So they're where they should be, which is their church. But the academy is growing. Well, we're growing. We're going to have more students this year than we've ever had before. And uh, we're praying about that and seeking God's direction in everything that we do. And, uh, but we need those packets. We need those packets so that we can get on the curriculum order. After um, the message tonight, we will have a quarterly report um, and business meeting. That shouldn't take too long. And then my last announcement is it is vacation season, and uh, we will have families traveling throughout the summer. Um, pray for them when they're not here for safety. Um, also, let me remind you to be in church. Be in church. Don't take a vacation away from God. 
wherever you go, wherever you are, um, when the doors of the church are open, have your family there. It'll, it'll make a statement uh, in your home, and it'll keep you focused on the word of God as you're traveling. And so just wanted to say that. Ushers, if you'll come, we'll take up the offering. Brother Anderson, would you come and ask the Lord's blessing as we worship and give? Let's pray. Father, we just want to start off by saying just thank you, Lord. Thank you for, for life. God, thank you for the opportunity for life everlasting. And we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to just be with our, our church as we seed out your word. I pray, God, that we would just um, thank you for all the things that, that you do for us, Lord, and, and, and honor you in the area of tithing and, and offering, God, that we are um, doing what we've, we've said that we would do, Lord, that we've, we've vowed, God, that we've prayed to you about, oh, Lord. So I pray that we continue to take care of our responsibilities, Lord, that we would just worship you in this area, oh, Lord, and that we'd be right. So I just pray for the tithes and offerings as we um, take them up. I do pray, God, that our, our attention would be on your, your word tonight, God, as we continue to learn while we, we hold to the King James Bible. And, Lord, we are thankful unto you. We pray, God, that we want to see other people coming out, oh, God, that we're praying for our VBS, Lord, that we're praying for people who are hurting right now, oh, God, and that we want to see their lives change, God. So we're thankful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand on one last time as we sing 873, Living by Faith, 873, our final song this evening. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, because we're living by faith, 873.
be seated. It may not always be fun to live by faith, but it is always exciting. Think about that. Never a dull moment when you're living by faith. Um, I'm excited about our church being more rooted and grounded and why we hold to the King James Bible. I don't think we can learn too much about it. I'm thankful that uh, Brother Cloud has these recordings. I'm thankful that he loves uh, churches enough to put this material out. And I'm thankful for another voice. Um, there was a few years ago I taught through for several weeks on why we use the King James Bible. And, and, um, and I enjoyed doing that. And uh, maybe I'll do it again down the road. But I felt that it would be good also to have uh, Brother Cloud's uh, years of wisdom, his learning, his perspective on this important issue. And uh, we, we're, not gonna let, we're not going to let go of our King James Bible. And, but we're not doing that by tradition. We're doing that by conviction. And that's what these lessons are all about. And so pay close attention, take notes, because you never know what's going to happen. Why we hold to the King James Bible is our subject this week, and we're looking now at the uh, five major reasons why we hold to the King James Bible, which is the heart of our course. Number one, because of divine preservation, and uh, then because the modern textual criticism is heretical, and because the modern versions are a product of apostasy, and because of the King James Bible's superior doctrine, and because of its unmatched history and character. And so we're still on the first point on the cause of divine preservation, and we have looked at the Bible's teaching on preservation, some of the highlights, and we are looking at five periods of church history tracing the transmission of the Bible down since the days of the apostles and seeing what kind of Bible that God has preserved for us through that history. We looked at the apostolic period, which is the completion of the Bible. We looked at the post-apostolic period, the attempt to corrupt the Bible. The fourth to the tenth centuries, the traditional text wins the Bible. The Inquisition era, 12th to the 16th centuries, the persecution of the Bible by the Roman Catholic Church, and then the Reformation era, the printing of the Bible, and that's where we are tonight, and that's where we begin. And generally speaking, the King James Bible, the Greek text, the Hebrew text underlying the King James Bible is what was preserved down through the centuries, and we've seen those highlights. But we come up to the era of the printing of the Bible. The printing of the Bible. And we have six main lessons here. <clears throat> I think there's five in your notes. But six. Number one, God's promise of preservation tells us that the Bible came out of the Dark Ages intact. Number two, the Hebrew Old Testament was first printed in 1494. Number three, the Greek New Testament was first printed in 1516, went through several editions. 
Number four, the Greek received text in the Hebrew Masoretic text translated into the major languages of the world. We're talking about the 16th to the 19th centuries and, it, and, and those Bibles went to the ends of the earth, great end time missionary movement. And number five, God's people had confidence in the preserved scriptures throughout this period. And we're going to see a few examples of that. There was no doubt about the, that the Word of God had been preserved by God's people in those days. And then number six, Bible believers of that era were not trying to recover the pure scriptures. They were busy preaching the scriptures to the ends of the earth and is what we're supposed to be doing today. And so we, we began uh, going back to God's promise of preservation. And so those, that era of fierce persecution had gone on for century after century, and the Roman Catholic Church did everything it could to keep the Bible out of the hands of the people, and, and burned Bibles, and burned Bible translators, and uh, it's an amazing history. We've just glanced at it. And uh, the Roman persecutions, and by the emperors, and, and uh, in all kinds of ways the Bible was attacked. And yet, because, and only because of God's promise of preservation, do we know that it came out of all of that intact. But because we do believe the Bible, we believe that it did. Psalm, uh, uh, Matthew 24, 35, just one remembrance. Reminder of these promises, these great promises, and this one by Jesus himself. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth. And so this is 2,000 years ago. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. One of many, many promises God would preserve his word. It is reasonable to believe that he would, but it's not only reasonable. It is an absolute doctrine of the Word of God. And so if we look at man through that history, we would not have any confidence at all that the Bible could have come across intact from the days of the apostles. It would not be possible for man to have preserved the Scriptures. But we're not looking at man, we're looking at God. And so we know for sure, based on the authority of God's own Word, that the Bible did come across to us through all those centuries into this important era when the Bible was finally printed, one of the most important events of church history, it can, the, the right Bible was printed. That's what Edward F. Hills observed. And we have the quote there, the God who brought the New Testament text safely through the ancient and medieval manuscript period did not fumble when it came to transfer the text to the modern printed text, printed page. This is the conviction which guides the believing Bible student as he considers the relationship of the printed textus receptus, which means received text, to the traditional New Testament text found in the majority of the Greek New Testament manuscripts. It is inconceivable that the divine providence which had preserved the New Testament text during the long ages of the manuscript period should blunder when at last this text was committed to the printed press. Now, humble Bible believers uh, have no problem believing that kind of thing. And it's men that do, uh, do not believe God's Word that have a problem with these things and make these things very complicated. Number two, the Hebrew Old Testament was first printed in 1494, which we've added to the text today, in fact. And this was printed. We can't leave out the Hebrew Old Testament, although we're focusing more on the, on the Greek New Testament. But printing was invented by movable type in about 1450. The first book ever printed on movable type was a Latin Bible printed in about 1455. And, uh, and, and then very quickly, the Hebrew Bible was printed. Portions of it were printed. These were Jews doing this work at first. And uh, one family of them, Sonsino, in northern Italy, that was a family of Jewish printers. And they, uh, they would move around some, but 
at that time, they were in northern Italy, and in fact, they got their name from a town in northern Italy, Sonsino, and they printed the first Hebrew Bible with all the little jots and tittles, amazing piece of work, and because uh, they had to make all of those little jots and tittles with their type. And uh, the pieces of the type that they used to set up the books. And we're told that those, those printers, that family of printers, excelled all the others in their perfection of type and their correctness. They were very meticulous, just like the old Masorites, who counted every letter. And, 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 and we looked at that just a little bit. And, and they gave us the first he printed Hebrew Bible, but the most important printed Hebrew Bible and the one that was used as a foundation for the English and the German and the Spanish and Italian and whatnot was the Jacob Ben Chayim. He was the printer and uh, uh, he, he was the man who, the Hebrew on the side of that, the Jew, but then there was the printer who was named Bumberg and so it's come, called the Bomberg edition, and uh, still used, still in print. 14, 1524 to 25 was when the perfected edition finally appeared, and so that became the foundation for uh, the German Luther, first of all, and then other great Protestant and Baptist translations, the Bomberg edition. And that was the first Hebrew Bible to ever include chapter and verse numbers. And it was based on the Masoretic text. Those Masoretes who, those Jews who meticulously preserved the scripture uh, at a time when, it, when the Jews were scattered all over the earth and it looked like maybe even the Hebrew language would be lost. And they were very careful to add the vowel points. Uh, before that, the Hebrews there, is, there are vowels in the Hebrew language, but they were assumed, they were memorized. They were not ever written down until the early centuries A.D. when the Masoretes wrote them down so they wouldn't be lost. But it was very important because that's why we have them today, Ben Chayim. And they searched all over for Hebrew codexes and to find the very best uh, Hebrew uh, uh, manuscripts and codexes to use for the printing of the first Hebrew Bible. Then number three, the Greek New Testament was first printed in 1516. 1516 by Erasmus, and it went through several editions. And that is the Greek New Testament that has many different names as we've looked at very briefly. It's called the Received Text, or Textus Receptus in Latin because it was the text commonly passed down through the centuries. And that's what God people, God's people believed. It wasn't just an advertising blurb. They believed that, that they, they were receiving the Word of God from the apostles and from the old prophets because of God's divine preservation. It is called the majority text because it represents the vast majority on the Greek side of more than 5,400 manuscripts that still exist, vast majority. It's called the majority text. It is called the traditional text. That's what John Bergon liked to call it, because it represents the text traditionally uh, used by the churches down through the centuries. And it's called the common text. And uh, it's called the Byzantine text, because it was preserved in the Eastern Roman Empire which today is called the Byzantine Empire. And that's where Greek was preserved after Greek fell out of use in the Western Roman Empire over on the Roman side. So Constantinople, capital of the Eastern Empire, Constantinople originally was called Byzantium and so Byzantine Empire. But they kept the Greek manuscripts that they had gotten from Antioch and Syria, from Paul's territory. And they kept them, and they preserved them, and so it's called the Byzantine text. And it's called the Antiochian text. And the, all of this is very interesting, because this is what these unbelieving modern textual scholars call it. But, and they think it's 
not good that it is called Antiochan, but I believe it is good because Antioch is where I would expect the Word of God to be preserved. And that great church there, the first missionary church, and, and they would have collected the letters of Paul, and they would have had the first canon of Scripture settled there. That's what they call it. They know it comes from there. And so the Greek received text, which is what we're calling it, was first published by a man named Erasmus. I don't know if he was saved or not. I think he might have been. He's, he was a Roman Catholic, but he's, he was not any kind of Roman Catholic as uh, what most of them were in that day. For one thing, he wanted the Bible to be put in the hands of everyone. And that was going against the Pope. And so that he had things like that that show that he was a different kind of Roman Catholic, but he was a great scholar, probably the greatest scholar then living. And uh, he was a humanist, but that doesn't mean what it means today. Humanist today means anti-God, atheist, basically, at least an agnostic. In those days, it meant a scholarly man who wanted to get back to the originals of everything. And in that part of Europe, they wanted to get back to the originals of the Bible. That's why he uh, printed the Greek New Testament. And, and, and he wanted to uh, correct all Bibles, Catholic Bibles, in Latin, from the Greek. He was a humanist in that sense. And uh, we, we visited the Erasmus Inst uh, Museum a few years ago and talked to one of the Erasmus scholars there. And she said, yeah, humanist. He was a humanist, but not by the modern definition. And so it's important to understand. People will criticize Erasmus and say, well, he was just a humanist. Yeah, but what does that mean? He wrote the Christian Soldier's Manual. I like the idea of Christian soldiers. I like the idea that every believer is a soldier in God's army. And, uh, and Erasmus did too. And it was so sound, doctrinally sound, that William Tyndale translated it into English. He wrote a treatise on the preparation for death. And he said, we are assured, this is certainly not Catholic teaching, we are assured of victory over death, victory over the flesh, victory over the world and Satan. Christ promises us remission of sins, fruits in this life a hundredfold, and thereafter life eternal. And for what reason? There, that's the catch. What reason? For the sake of our merit? No, indeed. But through the grace of faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Christ is our justification. Christ is our victory. Christ is our hope and security. I believe there are many not absolved by the priest, not having taken the Eucharist, the Mass, not having been anointed, not having received Christian burial, who rest in peace, while many who have had all the rites of the church and have been buried next to the altar have gone to hell. Now that was not an ordinary Roman Catholic. and certainly not a humanist today. And so whatever it was, he was certainly not an ordinary Roman Catholic. In fact, Hugh Pope, who was a Roman, strong Roman Catholic, said Erasmus expressed doubts on about almost every article of Catholic teaching. Well, good. I think that's a great bonus in his, for him. And we have some other facts about Erasmus there. He advocated believers' baptism by immersion. In his paraphrase on Matthew 28, Erasmus wrote, he wrote it originally in Latin, after you have been taught, after you have taught them these things, and they believe what you have taught them, have repented of their previous lives, and are ready to embrace the doctrine of the gospel, then immerse them in water. Immerse them in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, so that by this holy sign, sign, not a sacrament, sign, which is exactly what we Baptists believe, that, that they they may believe that they have been delivered freely through the benefit of, his, of, my, of my death 
through the filthiness of all their sins and now belong to a number of God's children, to the number of God's children. That is believer's baptism by immersion. Anyway, that's what he actually wrote. And so we give other quotes. In fact, he spoke against Rome very forcefully. That was a death sentence in those days. It was the same time as Luther. Same time. And Pope Leo and, and uh, trying to kill Luther. I mean, it was a dangerous time to be speaking against the Roman Catholic Church in any way. But he did. Erasmus did. Sharply. M Matthew 23, 27. Jesus' sermon against the Pharisees and, and the, called them whited sepulchers. Erasmus said, what would Jerome say could he see the virgin's milk exhibited for money, the miraculous oil, the portions of the true cross, enough if they were collected to freight a large ship? Yeah, the Roman Catholic Church, all the churches claim to have a piece of the true cross. And Erasmus said, really, if they were put together, it would be a huge ship. He's talking about the nonsense of these Roman Catholic practices. And he's rebuking them sharply in print, publicly. And we give other quotes there. He speaks about the, the, um, the qualification for a pastor to be the husband of one wife, which the Roman Catholic Church preached against and taught that they must be so-called celibate. And so there was that side to Erasmus. He was not bold like a, like a Luther or a William Tyndale, but he, but he was a very much not a normal Roman Catholic. Whether he was saved or not, I don't know. There's very, there is a great possibility he was. He died in 1536 in Switzerland among his Protestant friends. He didn't die among Roman Catholics. This is another thing. Um, there's a famous painting of him, of Erasmus, sitting with his Protestant friends um, in this very place where he died. That, that's who he associated with, was drawn toward in his last days. And they have that actual original painting there in the Erasmus Museum in Belgium. And he was definitely rejected by the Catholic Church. They knew who he was. They knew their friends and they knew their enemies. His books were burned throughout Europe. His works were placed on the index of prohibited books by Pope Paul IV in 1559. Erasmus himself was branded as a heretic at the Council of Trent. Well, that's Erasmus. But, it, but he's the one that God raised up, that God chose, the greatest scholar of Europe, to print the first Greek Bible major event in history. God wrote the New Testament in Greek, and here, but it was never printed, handwritten. And for, the, for it to be printed, and now to be a, 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 able to go to the ends of the earth easily, to, to fly, that was a major, major turning point in history. And what Greek New Testament was it? Well, it was the one upon which, exactly upon which our King James Bible was translated into the German Luther and the Spanish Valera and all those great translators. Was that the preserved Word of God? Of course it was. Had to be. Erasmus. And so, the Greek received text. And by the way, as far as questions goes, um, answers to questions on this issue, we have something called the Modern Bible Version Question and Answer Database. And it's online at the Way of Life website, and it's free. And um, you can't get any cheaper than that. And it answers a lot of questions. It's a pretty big book. The Bi Modern Bible Version Question and Answer Database, which is there in your notes. So what was happening? The Greek received text was printed by Erasmus, and then the Greek first, and then the Greek received text was revised by men who separated from Rome. And these men, all of these men who printed that Greek New Testament were going against the Pope, were endangering their own lives, and they were very much not Roman Catholics. Robert Stephanus, 
We give the names of these major families here. Roger, Robert Stephanus, also known as Esteem, he published four editions of the Greek Received Text. And he was responsible for the modern verse divisions in the Bible. It was said that he did that work while he was riding his horse here and there. And it seems like it in a lot of places. <laughs> the horse stumbled or something. But it's a great help. It wasn't a part of the Bible until those late, uh, you know, just a few centuries ago. But it's a great help to find things. Before that, there were no verse divisions. The Greek received text was printed, revised and printed, but the revisions were very minor. Printed by Theodore Beza. He published 10 editions of the Greek received text, 10 editions. And he was ahead of the Protestant community in Geneva when John Calvin died, which is too bad. I'm not a fan of John Calvin. But Beza, he, he, he traveled. He, he assisted the Waldenses and uh, traveled and preached and viewed the Roman Catholic Church as apostate. He saw the Waldenses as faithful Christians who had been se separate down through the Dark Ages. Beza, these were Bible-believing men, and they were the printers of the received text. And then a family of Dutch printers named Elsevier. Elsevier published two editions of the Greek received text. And that's when the word received text first appears in print. The preface to their second edition, 1633, the phrase Textus Receptus, received text, made its first appearance and uh, received text. Jesus said, as he's praying to the Father in John 17, the words that you have given me, Father, I have given to these men, and they have received them. And then Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, you have received these words as the word of God, as they are indeed the word of God, receiving the word. That's what you've got to do to be saved, and that's what you've got to do to grow, and uh, that's the greatest evidence that you are saved. You receive the Word. If you're not interested in the Word of God, you're not saved. The Bible says that. Dr. Edward F. Hills, commenting on these facts that we're looking at about received text. This statement has often been assailed as a mere printer's boast or blurb. No doubt it was partly that. But in the providence of God, it was also a true statement. For by this time, the common faith had been uh, present not only in Erasmus, but also Luther, Calvin, Beza, and we can mention Tyndale and many others. The doubts and reservations expressed in their notes and comments had been laid aside and only their God-guided texts had been retained. They knew God had preserved the Scriptures. And they had no doubt about what they were doing and what they had, what they were printing. And yet, when we come to the textual critics, we quote here from Kurt and Barbara Alland. These are German in the last generation. They're both, no, she's still alive. Uh, Kurt is dead. And, uh, but they are the most prominent textual critics of this generation. And they don't believe anything about the Bible as far as divine inspiration that I can tell. It is just a book, a religious book to them. And this is what they say. They, and they admit that it was formally accepted as the inspired scripture by Protestants in general. This is what they say. Every theologian of the 16th and 17th centuries worked from an edition of the Greek text of the New Testament, which was regarded as the revealed text. This idea of verbal inspiration, this idea, was applied to the Texas Receptus. And they think that is just an amazing thing that somebody could be so gullible. But they're admitting that that's what God's people believe. And they believed it. 
because of the Bible itself and their faith in divine preservation. And they go on in their, in another book, they go on the text of the New Testament and they say it was regarded, the received text was regarded as preserving even to the last detail the inspired and infallible Word of God himself. Yes, that's exactly what it was, what it is. And they're just amazed at such ignoramuses. There's only a slight difference. Just hitting some highlights of these things. There's only a slight difference between any of the various editions of the received text. We've mentioned 10 and very slight little differences. Very slight. And we have a little study on that. And we have a study, in fact, some of the most important of the differences between editions of the received text. And it's a very small study because the edition, the, the, the differences were extremely small. These were the same Greek New Testaments. Number four, the Greek received text and the Hebrew Masoretic text were translated into the major languages of the world in the 16th to the 19th centuries and went to the ends of the earth. That is a great event in church history. God in his great mercy allowed printing to be invented in these late late times of the church history 1400 years had gone by and had, and uh, and allowed and 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 worked out that there would be a great missionary movement in these last days before the collapse of everything we're we're down toward the collapse of everything but a great missionary movement amazing missionary movement and what were they doing they were they were carrying bibles to the ends of the earth and it was the Bible that changed people and converted people and built churches and built homes and all over the world, all over the world. And it was this kind of Bible. It was, in a lot of cases, this very Bible, the King James Bible, the English Bible, the English language became a world language because of the British Empire upon which the sun never set. Hail Britannia. And, they, and then the American Empire, but... Absolutely. America is a major reason why English is the world language. And if you fly anywhere and the pilots talk to somebody, they have to learn English. They have to learn English well enough uh, so they don't make a mistake and crash the plane. Yeah, English is the world language. God knew that. Nobody else knew that. William Tyndale certainly didn't know it. English was no world language in his day. It was no world language in the King James Translator's day yet. No, God knew that. It's a very special Bible. But it went to the ends of the earth. It was translated into all the major European languages. We give some of the examples there. It was translated into Native American languages in America. We give some examples there. It was translated into... Language, major languages of India. India's got tons of languages. It is a Babel in itself. And, uh, and godly missionaries, a great hardship. In those days in India, it's hard there. It's hard in India today. But a great hardship and self-sacrifice. And, and these, going to these kind of places was often a death sentence. If not for you, for your kids, for your wife. Yeah, it was hard. And they but they translated the Bible, the same kind of Bible we have, into those languages. We give many examples. And it was translated into the uh, major languages of the world. And we give many examples. It was an explosion of missionary work. And all because the Bible was being printed. It all was founded on that. And, uh, and that's just a partial list, which we give here. It's a long list, but it's a partial list. The Bible or portions thereof have been produced in almost 900 languages. But since the, since the turn of the 20th century especially, a large majority of those new translations are, are corrupt, terribly corrupt. So, but the <clears throat> received text Bibles went to the ends of the earth. Were they corrupt? Did God not keep his word? 
and give those printers, translators, the right Bible. Of course, he did. He did give them. There is no doubt about this. This is, to me, just as clear as anything in the world that God has preserved his word and that this is it. It's as clear as anything. There's just no doubt at all in my mind. Number five, and the text of criticism is totally wrong. Number five, God's people had confidence in the preserved scripture throughout this period. We've already quoted the Westminster Confession of Faith of 1648, and that was repeated in the London Baptist Confession of 1677 and the Philadelphia Confession of 1744, and that was Baptist too, I believe. And, but they all, they copied this basically because it's so beautiful and accurate. The Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at the time of the writing of it was most generally known to the nations because of the Greek Empire, Greek, and the Roman Empire was founded on the Greek Empire, being immediately inspired by God, immediately inspired. That's powerful language. That means like God's writing it. And he might as well have. Immediately inspired. You've got to get inspiration, right? And by his singular care and providence. So not just singular care. So God was single-minded about keeping this book pure in all languages. Of course he was. But that was the faith of God's people in former times are therefore authentical. So this book is authentical. Authentical so as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal unto them. And then you have the formula consensus Helvetica 1675. And we give that quote. And we could give many, many other quotes. We quote the Protestant Confession of Faith, London, 1679. And by the Holy Scriptures, we understand the canonical books of the Old and New Testament, that's these 66 books, as they are now translated into our English mother tongue, and so they're talking about the English Bible, of which there hath never been any doubt of their verity and authority in the Protestant churches of Christ to this day. That's what God's people, Bible-believing people believe, Baptists and Protestants alike, in the 17th century. And they are applying it to the English Bible, which is exactly this book I'm holding up today. This is very important. Number six, Bible believers of that era were not trying to recover the pure Scriptures. They were busy preaching the Scriptures to the ends of the earth. And we have the testimony of John Burgon. Uh, we've already given it, but it's so beautiful. I don't think any other one man has looked into the history of the Bible more than John Burgon did. And he was a Bible believer. He believed in the divine inspiration of the jots and tittles. He was the last man for sure that preached the divine inspiration of the Bible at Oxford University. And his sermons is in print, and it's magnificent. It's one of the best sermons that's ever been preached, as far as I know, on the divine inspiration of the Bible by this Anglican, John Burgon, great scholar. He never married. He devoted his entire energies to tracing the history of the Bible and then defending it. He was a warrior. That's rare. Among scholars, that's very rare. But he was, and he was willing to speak out. He was willing to pre uh, warn about Westcott and Hort by name and, and, and receive all the scorn and, and mocking and ridicule that comes from that kind of stand. You lose your reputation as a scholar when you take a stand like that and start treating this as, as, a, as the Word of God instead of just a book. 
you're no longer a scholar by the, in the eyes of the scholars. Now you're a nut. And that's what they thought about Burgon. But he was a greater scholar than any of the people that, that mocked him. Yeah, that's the way it is. And that's why very few do it. And that's why I love Edward F. Hills. But this man too, John Burgon. And so after looking at the history of the Bible, beginning with the, his collection of 86,000 quotations of the Bible in, in the writings of preachers, you know how we quote the Bible, from the first four centuries, collected that. Labor. Unbelievable labor. Just work. And, 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 all, and, and examining the Greek text and the lectionaries and everything and the versions. He said, call this text Erasmian. And so we know now what that means, Erasmus, printer of the first Greek New Testament. Or Complutensian. That was a polyglot Bible that had the received text printed in it. The text of Stephens or Abiza. We know who those guys are. The Elzevers. We know Elzevers. We know who those guys are now. I call it received or the traditional Greek text or whatever name you please. The fact remains that a text has come down to us which is attested by a general consensus of ancient copies, ancient fathers, and so he's talking about the preachers that wrote in the early centuries. They're called church fathers. They're, they're not that. But, but they, uh, their writings have survived, and he checked what Bible they were quoting, what text they were quoting, and ancient versions. Yeah, and he said it's this one. That's a very, very, very powerful statement. And so, the preservation of Scripture, what the Bible teaches, that God definitely would keep His Word, jots and tittles keep it. And uh, then we've seen how that is operated, just some basic highlights in five major eras of church history. And so the conclusion, number one, we have a choice today between the Alexandrian Greek text that came from Egypt or the traditional text that came from Antioch. Number two, to summarize, we trace the New Testament text through five important periods in church history. Number three, the Bible that came to us out of the Dark Ages is the Masoretic Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek received New Testament, no doubt about it. Number four, if that text is not the preserved Word of God, then the preserved Word of God, then the Word of God will never be recovered. It would be impossible. Either God's kept it or not. What do we stand? We're going to stop there for this session and then continue in the next.